Hey everyone, we're going to take a look today at the pretty new book from Ezra Klein, uh, Why We're Polarized. So just like my uh, other review format, I'm going to look at the main idea of the book, the research behind it, how readable it is, how convincing it is, and then maybe talk about a few other books that are kind of related, related to it that might be of interest. Uh, but Ezra Klein, in case you don't know who he is, he's a fairly well-known uh, journalist, media personality. He has a uh, really successful podcast called The Ezra Klein Show, and he's probably the most known for being one of the founders of Vox, the Vox Media Group. So he does a lot of writing, has a, had a long career, particularly in um, uh, journalism. So this is a pretty new book, and the title kind of gives away the premise, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the main idea. And so he is taking it for granted that we are polarized. He doesn't really try to take uh, make the case that we're polarized, I think. And I think most people probably don't need that case to be made for them at this point. Um, I'm recording this uh, in September of 2020, right before the election of 2020. So um, it's not hard to, to look around and see the polarization right in our climate. So he's starting with that premise that is already kind of a given, and then trying to dig into why to the, um, the factors that have contributed to the polarization we find ourselves in. And um, essentially what he's doing here is he is pulling together like a constellation of different factors that he sees as significant. So some of these include some historical shifts, uh, particularly in politics. Um, there's also the media and social media in particular has a role to play. Uh, he also talks about psychology, um, in-group, out-group kind of psychological dynamics. Um, and he talks about some, some actual like structure and policy issues that have shifted. Um, but his historical work is pretty, pretty limited to maybe the 50s, mid-50s to the 60s um, until today. So about 60, 70 years, something like that. Um, so his case is essentially, his main idea is essentially all of these things have contributed to the polarization that we find ourselves in. And there isn't really, he doesn't really try to say that there's one silver bullet, but rather it's kind of, it's lots of things going on. So his research behind this is, it's limited to that historical window I mentioned. Um, he doesn't really go much before the 50s particularly the civil rights era in the 60s and the policy that changed around that is kind of his historical starting point. So I'll know that all of his research kind of falls after that until today. And particularly, he pulls on a lot of studies, um, sociological studies, demographic studies, uh, psychological studies, things like that. Um, and he's read a lot. I mean, he's read a lot of studies uh, that pull on all of those different aspects of our, of our culture and what's going on. Um, in people's in people's minds and kind of demographic shifts um, in political opinions, um, he's he's really read pretty pretty extensively on all of those things and incorporated that research into into his case. So it's you know like I said, some history, some psychology, some sociology, some policy issues uh, that all is in there. And from the fifties until now, I would say his research is is pretty strong. It's fairly it's yeah pretty comprehensive. And again, in that historical window and in those categories. Um, the readability is, this is the probably the strongest part of the book, in my opinion, is it's extremely readable. And I, I've had this, almost this working theory for a while. I've found that I tend to, setting aside whether you agree with journalists or whatever, I have found that reading journalists who write books, um, those books are just very enjoyable to read. I think... My theory is that there's something about the career of a journalist, especially someone who's been doing it for a long time, because journalists, especially those who worked in print journalism, are so constrained by word counts and by space that it, there's something about learning to write within those constraints that really clarifies and forces an economy of word use um, that, that just strengthens one's writing, uh, I think. And you know, Ezra Klein is no exception to that rule. This book is just super easy to read, and even though he's pulling on lots of data, and he's kind of, if you know his personality, he's kind of like a kind of a data numbers kind of person, and he does talk a lot about hard data and numbers, but he synthesizes it and talks about it in an extremely readable way. It's whether or not you agree with the case he's making, it's a super readable and just plain out enjoyable to read book um, because of the way it's written. So very very. High praise, in in my opinion, of the actual sheer readability of this. And then um, the question of it being convincing or not. Um, this is this is a really interesting question for multiple reasons. But 
One is that he's decided to keep his historical window to what I mentioned um, to the past 67 years or so. And um, some people might think that deeper work needs to be done to make an historical case for our polarization. So if you kind of, but if you kind of take his premise and take him at his premise that something has shifted from the 50s to now, um, especially in the political scene, he, he surveys kind of the, the uh, political parties in the 50s and how they were structured and how it looked and how it wasn't a big deal to be a member of one party and vote for candidates in another party, particularly in local elections. Like you didn't have this, you know, down the line, uh, party line voting like we do today. Like he, he kind of presents a the case for all for how that looked then and then why has it changed now. And I think he's he's really on to something in terms of all the factors that have contributed to that shift that it has changed. Um, in particular, I think there's a few areas that he does really good work on, and one is the the sections that are, where he talks about race. I, I think those are one of the areas that I've found the most convincing and it probably I was already, to be honest, already in kind of in agreement with him on that, that I think race and particularly how racial um, politics around race and identity politics and uh, policy around things like segregation and desegregation, like the shifting of all of that stuff, which is significant, particularly in the 60s of the Voting, Voting Rights Act and whatnot, those changes and the kind of racial dynamics around all of that are a big factor. And his work on that, I think, is very good. Also, his reporting and work on the, the in-group, out-group psychology is very convincing to me. I found, um, found myself thinking about things in a new way uh, after reading those sections and um, just thought it was really well argued. So um, I think that he's, I, I, would, I would be one who would say there is probably deeper stuff going on historically and actually there are other historical windows in which we were as polarized or more, like in the Civil War or things like that. I, I think there are deeper historical things that he doesn't get into that you know, it's kind of hard to fault him for not doing that because that's, again, not he, not the case he's trying to make per se. But in terms of the broader question of polarization, there are other things that one could look at. But for the case he's making, the particular factors he's pulling out, I think he pr presents a pretty compelling case that at least things like psychology, um, uh, sh shifting political landscape, shifting demographic and racial landscape, um, in our history, like at, at minimum, at least those things are coming together, not to mention social media on top of that um, and exacerbating a lot of these things. Uh, those things are com coming together to, to polarize us, to pull us apart. And um, I think I think he has he's pulling on a lot of the right threads. So I would say it's it's a compelling case overall. Um, I will say uh, maybe this is a little bit of a caveat or warning. I'm not sure. Um, if you are a right-leaning person, a more conservative, politically conservative person, um, Ezra Klein is, is a left-leaning pundit, um, and he, he doesn't try to hide that or I don't know, smoke screen that at all. He's very upfront about it. Um, and I would say he does a relatively good job for most of the book at being pretty even-handed um, in terms of what both left and right are doing to exacerbate all these issues. That being said, particularly the last two chapters, he does start to um, lean into critiquing the right in a different way than he critiques the left. And that may rankle or frustrate or feel one-sided, to, particularly to people who are, um, who are more politically conservative. They might, they might find that unfair. I'm not really sure. It's just something to know maybe going into it. Um, again, the case, you know, um, the question is, is he right or not, is still, is still a valid question. But just know that going into it. Um, that could affect maybe whether or not someone finds it compelling or ultimately convincing. But that's a little bit about uh, about why we're polarized. I, I would definitely recommend it, um, I think. Again, for the things I said earlier, the sheer readability of it and the sheer kind of informative nature of it because he's reporting so many studies and data. Um, for that alone, I think that uh, someone who wants to be informed politically of what's going on right now. This is a this is a really, really easy recommendation because almost anyone can pick it up and read it, even if you're not very fluent in what's what's going on in uh, political parties and, and whatnot. And I do want to talk about a few other books that I thought of while I was reading this that might be of interest. So he talks a little bit about history, but it's, it's just a few chapters. If you want to get more, uh, do a deeper dive on the history, the historical content, particularly over the same time period he's speaking of, then I would definitely recommend, I don't have a copy to, to put in front of the video here, unfortunately, because I read it from the library, but there's a book called Fault Lines, which is by two historians named Kevin Cruz and Julian Zellweiser, and it's a, it's a very good book. 
and it's particularly they start with I think the year 1974 is the actual starting date of their of their survey so it's a little later than his but it's basically the same era essentially and fault lines refers to what are the political and cultural fault lines that were drawn over these over, over these decades and uh, what are just the historical events and uh, things that have contributed to those fault lines getting more and more solidified so that's a that's a very good book that's pretty much just the history it doesn't do as much of this commentary that um, that Klein offers here so I'd recommend that. Um, and then just two more. Uh, one is if the psychology is of interest to you, then um, you have to check out, if you haven't yet, Jonathan Haidt, The Righteous Mind. This book is, in my opinion, and I, and I think a lot of people's opinion, it's kind of the gold standard in, um, of, of this area of moral psychology and moral reasoning. And you can see the subtitle there is Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. So it gets into the polarization con conversation as well, but it's all psychology. Um, Jonathan Haidt has done immense research and makes a case, very, very, very good, very convincing, ultimately, case for the factors in our psychology that contribute to our polarization and kind of our uh, tribal mentality, so to speak, of getting into huddles and getting into groups. And um, it's just, it's excellent. It's a little denser. It's a little more technical than Klein's writing, for sure. But, but if you, if you want to learn about that, this is the best book, in my opinion, to go to. And Jonathan Haidt is it's telling, too. Jonathan Haidt endorsed Klein's book um, because of uh, some of the natural overlap there. So I thought that was a good sign when I saw Jonathan Haidt's endorsement here. Um, so The Righteous Mind, I really highly recommend it. And then the last one, this might particularly be of interest to Christian readers, um, although I would still easily recommend this to really anyone who wants to do some deep thinking on this, particularly in our cultural moment. But... This is Confident Pluralism by John Inazu. It's not very long. It's a fairly short book, but it is highly technical. It's probably the most technical, even more so than The Righteous Mind. But John Inazu is a, a law scholar, and um, he uh, makes the case, particularly through dissecting Supreme Court decisions and some history there, um, he, makes a, he makes a case for the legal import of protecting a diversity of thought, actually. And um, so, and he also, the subtitle is Surviving and Thriving Through Deep Difference. So it's also kind of a personally encouraging book um, if you're someone who is struggling to know how to, not only just to make sense of our culture, but even how does, how does one hold to convictions in a confident way, um, knowing that those convictions are um, going to be challenging to some others, and other people will have convictions that are challenging to you in an intentionally kind of pluralistic setting. So John Inazu's book uh, is very good. There's a paperback edition of it out now, which is a bit cheaper um, if you don't want to get the hard, the hardback copy. Um, so yeah, those are three books, uh, Fault Lines, Righteous Mind, and Confident Pluralism, in addition to Ezra Klein's uh, good work here in Why We're Polarized that I would recommend. So I hope you found this helpful, and I'll see you for my next review.